known as Savant Syndrome, have somehow given Kim an ability to memorize facts and information that is without equal. Savant syndrome is a rare but spectacular condition in which somebody with a developmental disability, such as autism, uh, has some spectacular island of genius that stands in stark contrast to overall handicap. For years, doctors have tried to fathom Kim's spectacular brain. I'm just going to ask you some general questions. Can I do that? Yes. Okay. Today, it's the turn of the world's leading expert on savant syndrome, Dr. Darold Trafford. When did President Truman remove General MacArthur from his command? April 19, April 11th, 1951. When did Hong Kong return from British colonial rule to Chinese July, control? July 1st, 1997. When did Saigon fall to North Vietnam? April 29th, 1975. When Kim was nine months old, the medical world said he would never walk, talk, or be able to learn. Proving experts wrong, he is now believed to have the greatest factual memory in the world, memorizing 98% of everything he reads. I keep thinking that the, pretty soon the memory full sign has to come up like it does on a computer, but it doesn't. He continues to absorb, and uh, not only absorb, but also recall. What, what day was, was Easter this year? What was the day? It was March 23rd, and we won't see another one this early again until 2160. When, when we won't when, see it. When is the last time that we 1913. see 1913. So right? we don't see it. <laughs> uh, you, you folks should remember. So how many years before the next? 152 years. What year will that be then? 2160. It's believed Kim's talent may be partly down to the fact that his brain is wired in a completely different way from the rest of us. Since birth, Kim's corpus callosum the white matter that carries vital connections between the left and right halves of the brain has been completely missing. But, somehow, Kim's brain has managed to rewire itself in a unique way. This could explain his extraordinary genius. Now, what, what, is, what is the earliest that Easter has ever fallen? 1761, 1818, 2274. Well, when, how, do, how do you figure those things out, Kim? How do you do it? By looking at my own, own heart and my own mind. Kim, like most savants, doesn't explain how they do it. Kim, <laughs> Kim, how do you remember all that stuff? How I just you, know that. How do you, uh, uh, you just know? Uh, uh, how do you remember all that stuff, Kim? I just know a lot about it. And they don't really explain their methodology, and I think in in reality, uh, savants are not aware of what that process is. Every time I look at him and I, when I see it, it is, uh, I don't know, it, it, it blows me away. I look at him and I say, is everything for 10-year-old Ariel Lanyi, a child prodigy from Israel. Ariel is more than just a pianist. He's a composer too. Well, this could be an intro and then there could be a, a total well, This was there before? Yeah. No, that's what I want to write now. Now, first of all, I want to jot down the intro. Okay. Before we start anything. But didn't you have a subject? You had a subject. I'm going to do my Opus 8, Opus 9, and Opus 10, so I'm going to work on Opus 6, Opus 7. I don't have to do so. Then I'll work on Opus 8, then on Opus 9, and then on Opus 10. His achievements are beyond, far, far beyond, of any most gifted child that I've known. The question was, why do you take criticism from your teachers and not from your parents? And not from your mother. And not from your father either. <laughs> well, because my teachers are, are, are way smarter. <laughs> and that's nice. That's nice. Parents Gabby and Olga have raised their son in a home dominated by music. 
Ariel was destined to be a pianist right from the off. We were negotiating for a piano when, uh, when Olga was pregnant with uh, Ariel. And she said, well, why, why are you so anxious about it? What's the big deal? He's not going to come back home from the hospital and, and start taking piano lessons. And I said, no, but I don't want to bring the child back from the hospital into a home that doesn't have a piano. Neither Gabby nor Olga could play the piano. It was for one person only, their newborn child. When he was born, he started uh, listening to music right from the beginning because there was a tape that his father prepared for the occasion. And from then on, he was listening to music almost 24 hours a day. There is a theory that um, very young children can be taught anything. They don't have to be born that way. But the earlier you start the education, the more you'll be able to achieve. It soon became apparent that the theory was working. He was less than three, just a little less than three, and, and we were driving in a car, and he was sitting in the back, and we were listening to the radio, and it was Beethoven's second piano concerto, which I recognized, but I, I, don't, I don't know the key, and I didn't have the CD, so I told him this is a piano concerto by Beethoven. And I said, Ian, and I didn't have the answer because uh, I didn't have the CD to look at, right? And obviously I cannot tell. So he says, in B flat major. And I looked in the mirror and I said, are you sure? And he said, oh yeah. So needless to say, as soon as we got home, I take out the CD and I look at it, and it's in B flat major. By five, Ariel had already taught himself to play the piano and started taking lessons. By seven, he was playing classical concerts with an orchestra of adults. In a way, we created it to some degree by exposing him early on. And a little baby uh, doesn't have many choices, so he just lies on his back and you play Bach and you play Bartók and uh, he listens. Ariel is now firmly on the path for a life of music. But although showing a talent way beyond his years, he's wary of being labelled. I don't like the meaning of child prodigy. Because child prodigy is basically someone who can play fast. And, and not more than that. Not understanding music, just playing fast. And how are you different? Because I understand the music, I analyse. I... Are you a pianist or a musician? A musician. And are you a genius? <laughs> Not yet. <laughs> I will be one day, but not yet. <laughs> While Ariel developed his gift from an early age, others find greatness much later in life. But it doesn't always reap rewards. Ben Pridmore started out on the path to genius in his mid-twenties when he began training himself to memorise decks of cards. I held the record for memorising a pack of cards in the quickest possible time, 26.28 seconds. From just a single glance, Ben is able to recall every number and every suit in the exact order in which he saw them. Ready? Six of spades, queen of hearts, queen of diamonds, eight of spades, ace of hearts, no ace of diamonds. <laughs> Never mind. Um, queen of clubs. Ben is in training. Five of clubs. In just two days, he is Nine going to hearts. push himself to the limit Eight and attempt diamonds. to smash his own world record. Nine of spades. King of hearts. And three of diamonds. <laughs> <laughs> Ben's genius is not simply in remembering playing cards, but in the elaborate mental process he uses to do it. I have an image in my head of a person or an object for each pair of two cards, which comes to a total of 2,704 possible images. So, for example, this pack of cards starts with the Seven of Spades, King of Spades, which is a pack of seeds, growing into um, Two of Hearts, Five of Spades, which is Marty Pello, out of Wet, 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 and um, Five of Hearts, King of Clubs, which is Elmer Fudd. OK, make preparation time starts now. The key to Ben's memory genius is that he uses a different part of his brain to store new information compared to the rest of us. To remember cards, most of us would use our working memory. 
but this can only store up to seven new pieces of information.